Hello, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be able to share with you today. And though this talk did not go as planned and I was unable to be with you live, I so appreciate this time. My name is Larissa Patakiola, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And I'm going to talk with you today about cancer-related fatigue. I love this slide because I think it so perfectly illustrates cancer-related fatigue. And while this slide may be cute and funny, all of you can attest to the fact there is nothing particularly cute or funny about living with cancer-related fatigue. So what is the definition of cancer-related fatigue? Mastian and his colleagues tell us, cancer-related fatigue is a multifaceted, subjective, physiological state characterized by persistent, overwhelming exhaustion and a decreased capacity for physical and mental work. This is an old definition, but certainly nothing has changed about it. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN, in 2018 tells us, cancer-related fatigue is a distressing, persistent, subjective sense of physical, emotional, and or cognitive tiredness or exhaustion related to cancer treatment that is not proportional to recent activity and interferes with usual functioning. In my work with patients, we often discuss that cancer-related fatigue is long-lasting, does not diminish after a good night's sleep or a restful half-hour break. It's different from the tiredness related to everyday stress. It feels all-encompassing and can be difficult to explain to family and friends who are not living with Waldenstrom's. There are other ways to describe cancer-related fatigue. Some of those are exhaustion, inadequate energy, being lethargic, listless, lack of energy, tired, worn out, weary, exhausted, malaise, feeling run down. I'm sure those of you in the audience can think about some other ways and other words to describe this as well. Patients have described cancer-related fatigue as being feeling tired or weak, feeling like your arms and legs are heavy, not wanting to do things, not being able to concentrate, feeling irritable, feeling slowed down. I imagine that many of you listening to this today might be able to identify with these definitions. What is the pervasiveness of cancer-related fatigue? I'm sure in your discussions with friends and family members and other people you know who have Waldenstrom's or other kinds of cancer, it may feel like everyone has cancer-related fatigue. And some studies actually show that almost everyone does have cancer-related fatigue. 80% of patients can experience cancer-related fatigue. Bauer, in her review of some of the studies, found that 30 to 60% of her patients reported moderate to severe fatigue during treatment. But we do know that everybody experiences even just a little. What causes Waldenstrom's related fatigue? Cancer related fatigue can be brought about by a combination of things cancer itself, side effects of cancer treatments like chemotherapy and immunotherapy, depression or anxiety associated with having a chronic illness, or all of the above. We also know there are psychosocial factors that can cause cancer-related fatigue or can be related. We know there's a correlation between marital status and income. Those have been linked to cancer-related fatigue in some reports with unmarried patients who have a lower household income reporting higher levels of fatigue. This suggests that contextual factors, the absence of a partner who can provide instrumental and emotional support may influence the experience of the symptom. And this was from Bauer in 2014. This slide illustrates all of the factors that can influence cancer-related fatigue. Again, just in summary, a direct cancer burden, cancer treatment burden, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, hormone therapy, other medications related to your cancer that the side effects might contribute to fatigue. The cancer and treatment psychosocial burden, some of the things we just talked about, depression, anxiety, sleep disruption, pain, expectancy, self-efficacy, cognitive problems, relationship problems, employment problems. Some of the other comorbid conditions we know that people have in addition to cancer, because we know cancer doesn't happen in a vacuum, people often have other health-related conditions, anemia, deconditioning, skeletal muscle wasting, 
thyroid disease, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, renal disease, malnutrition, infection. All of these things can contribute to cancer-related fatigue. So when we look at this list, it's no wonder that so many of you are fatigued. This slide illustrates um, some of the things that were on this other slide that we looked at just in more plain language. Um, the buildup of toxic substances that are left in your body after the cells are killed by cancer, injury to normal cells, fever, if you have a fever, you're often more tired, infection, pain, dehydration. You have too little water in your body and you're feeling dehydrated. We often feel fatigued. Loss of appetite, not getting enough calories or nutrients trouble sleeping, anemia, shortness of breath, inflammation. We know in the blood cancers, a rise in inflammatory markers correlate with levels of fatigue. So that's often one way that your doctor will be able to tell whether or not you're fatigued. The risk factors for fatigue, they're genetic factors, their history of current levels of depression, treatment modality dependent, depending on what somebody, what kind of treatment someone's getting, whether or not someone's depressed, whether or not they have risk factors genetically that would make them more at risk for it. Sleep disturbance or pre-existing sleep, sleep, excuse me, dysregulation for people who have difficulty sleeping, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We'll talk about sleep hygiene and some ways to improve your sleep. Those can often contribute to better or worse levels of fatigue. If someone has an increased body mass index or pre-cancer inactivity that can also contribute to fatigue. Someone has a history of trauma. We carry around exhaustion, emotional, emotional exhaustion that we all carry around day to day in our baseline that contributes to how fatigued we are. If someone's got difficulty coping, you're having a hard time coping, coping excuse me, with your illness, um, feeling isolated, low levels of support. This gives somewhat of an explanation as to why some people experience and not others and this is still being studied, but we do know that these are risk factors that all influence it. So for those of you who are struggling with fatigue, what should I tell my healthcare provider about my fatigue? It can be hard to have a discussion sometimes with your providers about these kinds of things because we have very limited discussion with providers about the things that we need to talk with, so many of them that feel so important in the day-to-day -day or in a 15-minute visit. But if we go into our visits feeling prepared and we go in feeling like we can be very specific with our questions, that can really make a difference in how much your provider understands and what next steps can be to help with your fatigue. So before you go in to talk with a provider, think about things like, do you feel well enough in the morning when you wake up? Does your fatigue progress throughout the day? Do you nap unexpectedly or use excessive amounts of stimulants like caffeine? or other energy drinks to complete your daily activities? Does your fatigue come on gradually or abruptly? Is it a daily occurrence or does it feel more intermittent or periodic? What makes it better? What makes it worse? How has your life changed because of your fatigue? And be specific. So in other words, instead of saying, I was so tired yesterday, Think about saying, I could not work for three days. Is your fatigue mental or physical? Or is it both? There are a number of pharmacologic interventions that your physicians can look at when they're looking at whether or not they can target your fatigue. We'll talk about non-pharmacologic interventions in a little bit as well, but your doctor may think about these things to help you. And this is certainly one way they can target it. Corticosteroids, some of you know these already, I'm sure, dexamethasone, prednisone. You may be wondering, gosh, I'm already on these medications. Why is it that I don't feel any difference? But you may also be feeling a difference when you know when you've taken them and when you haven't, or when you have the dex crash. Psychostimulants, Ritalin, Adderall, growth factors antidepressants, treating the underlying medical condition. So we always wanna rule out whether there's some underlying medical condition that may be not related to your cancer or that maybe is related to your cancer and rule that out first or to treat that first. And always, always 
consult with your physician or your healthcare provider. Certainly it's easy to look at the steroids list and think, gosh, maybe if I take a few more steroids, that'll help with my fatigue. Definitely not something we suggest. Always talk to your doctor about increasing or decreasing or thinking about these things before you make any changes. There are non-pharmacologic interventions for managing cancer-related fatigue as well. Some of those things are physical activity, yoga, exercise rehabilitation, OT and PT, massage therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness, psychoeducation, restorative therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, bright white light therapy. We hear a lot about it that this time of the year, especially as the days get shorter and the lights get less. And a nutritional consultation. Target fatigue and all good reasons why it makes sense to have a team of people who are looking at your fatigue. Because if you think about it, all of these different interventions require usually a different level of specialty to help. So for physical therapy, we can think about an exercise physiologist. We have a wonderful exercise physiologist at Dana-Farber here and many other institutions have them as well. OT and PT, um, if you do yoga, if you do massage therapy and you have a massage therapist, um, if you have a therapist in the community and you're doing MS, excuse me, MBSR with mindfulness-based stress reduction or cognitive behavioral therapy, restorative therapy, all of those things are things you can talk to a therapist about. Bright white light therapy, if you have a psychiatrist, that's something you can ask your psychiatrist about or your PCP. We'll talk about that a little bit about what that is and what recommendations we give for that. And a nutritional consultation. If you have a dietitian at your center, you have a um, nutritionist who you can meet with in the community, we suggest that as well because they all have very good tips too. So how can I manage Waldenstrom's related fatigue? So these are just some of the ways as we talked about earlier, exercise, eating healthfully, don't overdo things, avoid stress where possible, improve your sleep hygiene. So multi-layered, that's the take home message here is that being multi-layered of an approach is the best way to do this. But that said, all of these feel simplistic because none of these all work by themselves or sometimes even all together. It can be a long process to get all of these things to work. One of the questions we hear a lot when we talk about exercise is how can I exercise when I am so tired? We know that even just doing something is better than doing nothing. And so when we talk about exercise, we don't encourage people to run marathons. We don't even think about running a 5K. We think about walking up the street, walking to get your mail, parking the car a little further away from the grocery store, all those things that we hear but there's a reason why we hear them because there's still things to add and there's still things that make a difference. We ask people to do your best to keep doing your current level of activity. Do some physical activity for three to five hours a week. That might help with cancer related fatigue. Again, we're not asking folks to run marathons. Walk daily if your healthcare provider says it's safe for you. Walking is one of the most basic of exercises that folks can do cheapest, don't need anything fancy, don't need any fancy equipment. You don't even really need good weather. Think about starting an exercise program that's appropriate for your treatment. Yoga or gentle stretching exercises might be helpful to include as part of an exercise program. We know that in some of the studies, exercise over yoga, yoga over psychoeducation, all of it over nothing is helpful in reduction of fatigue. Something is better than nothing. You've heard me say that many times through this slide and there's a reason why we say it. Something is better than nothing. If you see an OT or a PT, these are some of the things that you can think about how they can be useful. And you may be wondering if getting an OT might be helpful if your doctor hasn't suggested that it's something that you can think about asking for. OTs can improve activities of daily living, getting dressed, taking a shower, cooking a meal. They can help you to plan your activities so you're able to do as many physical activities as possible without getting too tired. They can also suggest ways that you can save energy and help you practice using special equipment. PTs can improve your ability to move by helping you to build your strength and your balance. They can also help you to develop a safe exercise plan that works for you. OTs and PTs can help you stay motivated. They can help you set goals. 
They can also help you to keep track of your energy level and make changes to your exercise plan as needed. This time of the year is an especially poignant one to be able to think about this slide in the most, most places of the world. Fall is a beautiful time of the year. It's one of my favorite times of the year. If you're able to get outside and we know that we feel good when we're outside for most of us, there's a reason for that. Research has shown that spending time in nature can offer physical and mental health benefits. Simply taking a short walk in the park, admiring your garden, watching birds in your backyard, sitting near the lake, all of these things are restorative. And even getting outside in its own right can make all the difference between you feeling a little bit tired and a lot tired. So let's talk about sleep. 30 to 75% of patients with cancer have sleep disturbances in our recent guidelines publication from the NCCN in 2018 we looked at this same publication and we knew that yoga was something to have been shown to improve sleep outcomes by inducing relaxation. So yes, how you sleep matters. Um, we know that all of these ways that we're gonna talk about here having to do with sleep hygiene all contribute, not just yoga. So if you can't do yoga, don't worry. Um, all of these ways can improve your relaxation and therefore can improve your sleep. So we say try to, to get, excuse me, continuous sleep at night instead of taking naps during the day. Limit your naps to 15 to 20 minutes in the late morning or the early afternoon so that you're still sleeping through the night. So the key is if you're going to nap, nap earlier in the day, not later towards the evening. Follow a bedtime routine. There's a reason when we're kids why following a bedtime routine is so important or why we have our kids try and do a routine before they go to bed, right? Because we want them to get good sleep. And that's true for us as adults as well. We ask people to avoid caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, anytime after six o'clock, all of those things are good to stay away from. And for some things like caffeine or coffee, tea, things that have larger amounts of caffeine, we say nothing after noon. Listening to music or reading before bedtime, those are things that can help you to relax. Some of these things though, it's important to think about what works for you. I have some patients sometimes who will say to me, I watch TV every night before I go to bed. That's the only thing that can help me to go to sleep. So some of these things fly in the face of traditional wisdom because traditionally we would say, don't turn the TV on. The light makes a big difference. But for people who know that this works for them, don't necessarily mess with what works. Try to go to bed at the same time every night, wake at the same time every day. It goes back to following a routine. It's a different kind of routine. If you notice changes in your sleep patterns, talk with your healthcare provider. Your healthcare provider, your physician, your social worker, your therapist, um, many of us talk with people on a regular basis about sleep hygiene and talk about ways to improve your sleep hygiene and making changes. So additional sleep hygiene recommendations. So limit the use of electronics, no phone, no TV to more than one hour before bedtime. And again, goes back to that previous slide when I was saying that for most people, we make these recommendations not to use this. If you are somebody who you know this doesn't impact your sleep, you don't necessarily need to rush out and make the change. If whatever you're listening to that podcast or whatever it is that you're doing on your phone is helping you to fall asleep, by all means, keep doing it. Set limits on work obligations before bed. Anything that stimulates your mind or stimulates activity, we don't necessarily want you to be overusing your mind. It's usually where most people are finding that they're staying awake and having a hard time sleeping. Ensure your room is at a comfortable temperature. Oftentimes when the room is too hot or too cold, it makes it hard to sleep. Use your bedroom only for sleep or intimate activity. Try meditation or prayer during periods of wakefulness in the night. And go to another room if you've been awake for more than 20 minutes. We usually say if you've been awake for more than 20 minutes, try another setting because what happens when you're in the same room for more than 20 minutes and you're struggling to stay awake and you're tossing and turning and you're looking at the clock, you start to develop an association with what it means to be awake. And so then your body starts to associate, oh, it's the bed. It must mean that I'm supposed to be awake, not asleep. How we eat makes a difference with cancer-related fatigue. 
So if you meet with a nutritionist, the nutritionist will tell you to eat small, well-balanced meals and snacks throughout the day, aim to drink eight to 10 ounces of glasses of water every day. And again, talking with a clinical dietitian or nutritionist at your center might be helpful. Your healthcare provider can give you a referral to meet with a clinical dietitian. Dietary patterns that reduce inflammation, such as the Mediterranean diet, other plant-based diets appear tolerable to cancer survivors, and they themselves might reduce fatigue. We saw this in Inglis in 2019, which is a more recent study. Supplementation with ginseng, ginger, or probiotics might improve cancer survivors' energy levels. We saw that in the same study. What we would say, though, is, again, like with all of this, check with your provider before adding any of those things into your diet. Increased protein intake might help to preserve lean mass and body composition. We also know that it helps with fatigue. Body mass index, as we stated earlier, really has an impact on fatigue. And so the more we can preserve that lean mass and get our body mass down, um, we certainly can influence whether or not we're fatigued. This slide, again, is one that um, shows a variety of cancer-related fatigue nutrition factors. So involuntary weight gain, starting at the bottom right corner there, obesity, whether or not we have inflammatory, inflammatory markers in our blood, protein, whether we're taking increased protein needs, whether we have abnormal metabolism makes a difference, anemia, B12 deficiencies, iron deficiencies, Malnutrition, if we're not getting the food we need, if because of chemotherapy, we have too much vomiting, too much diarrhea, um, or other malnutrition needs, we're simply not hungry because we're depressed and we're not eating enough. Malabsorption, those things can all increase or can all influence cancer-related fatigue. So all things to ask your doctor about. So we also know that there are emotional and psychological manifestations of cancer-related fatigue. So how we feel makes a difference. So if we're depressed or we have anxiety, it takes a lot of energy. Fatigue is a significant symptom itself of depression. And anxiety takes a lot of work and anxiety can make us tired and fatigued just by virtue of the fact that our mind never stops spinning. Hopelessness or negative outcome expectancy is when we expect the worst, that can be tiring too. It can feel like a weight weighing us down. Some of the cognitive symptoms that are we experience sometimes when we're fatigued, we have impaired memory, inability to concentrate. Those are things that also can correlate with fatigue. Reduction in ability to participate in leisure activities makes a difference. Reduced capacity to sustain meaningful relationships and activities with your family, feeling demoralized or discouraged about dependency on others. All of these things are manifestation of fatigue. So many times people will come and we use, we hear the term and we use the term depression so often in society now. It used to be that it was very taboo to talk about and now we talk about it often. And most of the time you'll hear people say, oh, I'm so depressed, I feel so depressed. And really to be depressed, we need to look at these things. There's really a constellation of symptoms that make someone depressed. If you have pervasive feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness, or negative mood for more than two weeks, Changes in eating. In other words, you're eating too much or you're eating too little. Changes in sleep, you're eating too much or too little. Withdrawal from friends and family. Finding little or no pleasure in your activities that were once enjoyable. Cognitive changes. Loss of focus, short-term memory, and an inability to concentrate. Suicidal or homicidal thoughts. All of these things are things that we think about when we're looking at whether or not somebody's depressed. To have all of these things together doesn't necessarily mean that you're depressed. If you had all of these things on the list, yes, we would think you were depressed, but you really need to have about five of these. So it's not just that one of these things or a couple of these things means that you're depressed. It's really five or more. And really over that period of more than two weeks. So what are some interventions for stress management? And again, we talk about stress management because the more relaxed we can be, the more we can reduce our stress levels, the more we know that impacts how fatigued we feel. So there are things like progressive muscle relaxation, mindfulness, yoga, hypnosis, cognitive behavioral therapy, counseling, biofeedback, 
support groups, online support, all of these things can make a difference in terms of how fatigued we feel. There are definitely mixed results about whether psychosocial interventions alone have an effect on fatigue, but we know that combined with other modalities, studies have shown that there has been a reduction or there is a reduction, a major reduction in fact, in cancer-related fatigue. So before I had said that we would talk about bright white therapy, and that's a common thing you hear around this time of the year, or light therapy, right? That's another word for it. Bright white therapy is not something that you need a prescription for. It's not something that you need um, to do anything fancy for. You can actually get a white light box on Amazon. Um, if you're looking to get a light box, we ask that you follow um, the following recommendations. Fluorescent light at home use. So look for something at home. You don't have to go someplace to do this. This is something you can set up at home in the morning when you first wake up for 30 to 90 minutes. It's traditionally used for mood disturbances and sleep disorders. The way that it works is it stimulates your hypothalamus, which regulates your circadian rhythms. And we know that some of the studies show that this really helps. The studies for this though are small and they're really only limited to patients at this point with breast cancer. So the question really still remains as to whether or not it might help you with Waldenstrom's, um, but it's worth a try. Cognitive behavioral therapy, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a therapy that focuses on the link between thoughts, feelings, and the associated behaviors. Their cognitive strategies, reframing, finding evidence, looking at facts versus opinion, challenging dysfunctional thought patterns. Most of us have some dis dysfunctional thought patterns that we use in our everyday life. But when we challenge those and we find ways to recognize them and deal with them, that can really help. And behavioral strategies, some of the things that we talked about before, like the progressive muscle relaxation and yoga and some of the behavioral strategies that can reduce stress. A study in 2006, which is an old study, but still relevant, 60% of cancer patients who underwent CBT versus those who were waiting for an intervention noticed that there was a reduction in their cancer-related fatigue. So what are other things that I can do? Track when you feel energized and when you feel exhausted and use that log to help you expend your energy when it makes the most sense. Look for patterns and maybe consider taking your log in with you to the doctor or to your nutritionist or to the OT so that you can talk together about ways that make the most sense um, during the times when you have the most energy and the times that you have the least energy to make changes. Consider scheduling your exercise and your errands and your appointments for a time of the day when you're least tired. Ask for help from others, especially when you're feeling low energy. It's normal to feel fatigued from Waldenstrom's. Being realistic about your energy levels can provide a sense of empowerment and can help you to feel more encouraged throughout the week. Just knowing that this is normal can make a big difference. When you're not feeling up to task, try not to be too hard on yourself and hopefully feel empowered enough to let other people know that you're not feeling up to it so that you can conserve your energy for another time. When we talk about conserving energy, we look at something called spoon theory, which is my next slide. Spoon theory was coined by Christine Mizzardino in 2003 in an essay called The Spoon Theory. So the idea was that the spoons represent finite amounts of energy we each have throughout the day. All of us have a certain amount of spoons in our life. Those of us who don't have Weldenstrom's or another type of cancer may have more spoons. Each spoon is delegated to a specific activity. So the idea is, is that when we take spoons away, each of those things represent an activity that we've taken away. Some of this came about because Mr. Dino's friend began watching her as she took her medication and asked what it was like to have lupus. This was irrelevant, not to cancer, but to lupus, which is another um, fatigue causing illness. Mr. Dino grabbed the spoons from around the dinner where they sat and she gave her friend the handful of spoons she had gathered. And the spoons helped Mr. Dino to show that the way with people with a chronic illness, including Waldenstrom's, often start their days off with limited degrees of energy. The number of spoons her friend had was how much energy she had to spend throughout the day. As Mr. Dino's friend stated the different tasks she completed throughout the day, she took away a spoon for each activity. She took spoon after spoon until her friend only had one spoon left. Her friend then stated she was hungry, to which Mr. Dino replied that eating would use another spoon. 
If she were to cook, the spoon would be needed for cooking, and she would have to select her next move wisely to conserve her energy for the rest of the night. So hopefully those of you sitting out there can identify with spoon theory, because it really does feel like every activity in our life, right down to eating, to cooking, to lifting the spoon to our mouth, represents yet another spoon. So the takeaways, I know we talked about a lot here in this last half hour. Cancer-related fatigue is real and pervasive. The causes are multifactorial and not pinpointed to one specific cause. In some cases, the cause is unknown. Cancer-related fatigue impacts the majority of cancer patients undergoing treatment and or post-treatment. Management is often multi-layered, so not one cause and not one answer, unfortunately. A three-tiered approach, exercise, cognitive behavioral strategies, and nutritional focus, all tend to give the best results. And as always, engage your provider. You are not in this alone. We have a saying at Dana-Farber and we say it often, you are not in this alone. We want you to come to us with your questions, with your concerns, with your worries. And fatigue is one that we know is a big worry. Thank you again. I hope that these slides have been useful as you think about how best to work with your providers around the experience of living with fatigue Take good care and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.